We're standing on the battle site of the Battle of Killiecrankie. In my hand, I have a cannonball which was found on the battle site. I've no idea how long ago that was found, but it is genuinely a cannonball from the battle. I've known it now for over 70 years. I was always intrigued by it as a little, as a young boy. Now, as a slightly older young boy, I'm in a position to investigate how it got there and from what sort of artillery it was fired. Now, before we go into examining the details of the artillery, it's well worth knowing that at the time of the battle, England and Scotland had separate parliaments. But from 1603, after the death of Queen Elizabeth I, they had a single monarch. Now, in 1685, James II of England, also known as James VII of Scotland, became the monarch of the three countries, England, Scotland and Ireland. He was a Catholic king, and there were members of Parliament who were of the Protestant persuasion who did not like the Catholic Association. So they invited William of Orange and his wife to come across and to become the King of England and Scotland and Ireland. Consequently, you had two camps, each supporting a different king. February 1689 that William and Mary were installed as joint monarchs. So coming up to date to the battle of July the 27th 1689 the Scottish government forces of the Protestant King William III and Mary under the command of General Hugh Mackay opposed the Jacobite forces supporting King James VII of Scotland under the command of John Graham of Claverhouse, also known as Bunny Dundee. The two sides were fighting for their own king of the same country. The battle itself is associated with a number of innovations. The Highland Charge, which was used successfully throughout the Jacobite campaign. The first use of grenades. The first use of platoon firing and the introduction of socketed bayonet to replace the plug bayonet. But there's one other first. It's possible the only occasion in military history when anyone was hit by artillery fire and lived to tell the tale. In this, in, in this instance, it was a Jacobite soldier was struck by a cannonball fired from one of the government army's leather cannons. More about that event later. The so-called leather guns of the 17th century originated in the 1620s. That's more than 60 years before the Battle of Killiecrankie. The idea was to produce a light mobile artillery and it came, the idea came from Sweden and arrived in England in 1629. Until this time, most guns had been so unwieldy and heavy that they could only be placed in one position on the battlefield, provide an initial salvo, and then they were unmovable. And a series of experiments were initiated aimed at producing a gun which was effective in giving protection against the enemy infantry and cavalry, which could be moved quickly to keep up with the advance or retreat of the infantry. Now let's look at the design of the leather gun. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it's not actually made out of leather. It is actually sheathed in leather. Here is a picture of a leather gun. It's got an, um, an iron core and it's bound by metal rings and rope. And this is covered with a damp sheath of leather, which when it shrinks, the leather binds the whole formation together into a tight unit. Now, 
the idea sounds very good but unfortunately what the leather, the leather did is it prevented the heat from dissipating from the cannon and as a result the cannon tended to lose shape and sometimes it even exploded. Now there were times when additional gunpowder was put into the guns in order to increase the velocity but this also resulted in an explosion which could possibly have severely injured the loader. Despite the problems with the leather guns one point in their favour is that they over a period of time highlighted the usefulness of mobile fire support. On arrival from Sweden in 1629 witnesses of the gun said these pieces are of very great use and very easy and light of carriage one horse may draw a piece and does execution very fair. Interestingly enough, leather type guns were recorded in Korea from around 1649, but instead of a leather cover, the Korean model used thick paper saturated with grease. The Koreans, however, acknowledged the lightness and super superior maneuverability of leather type artillery. Leather guns were first constructed in England during the Civil Wars 1642 to 1646 by James Weems, a Scots veteran in the Continental Wars. In 1648, Weems was appointed General of Artillery in Scotland and was given exclusive right to manufacture leather guns. Most Scottish leather guns are attributed to James Weems and were quite probably made and tested in the Burnt Island Weems area of Fife. Compared to the Continental guns, the shorter Scots guns did mean range and accuracy were sacrificed, but the disadvantages may have been compensated for by their mobility and greater destructiveness at closer range. This picture of leather guns shows the longer version which is more popular in the continental design. Surviving leather guns can be divided, divided into six main types on the basis of their size and number of barrels. There is a surprising amount of variation in caliber and barrel length possibly as a result of imprecision in manufacture as the guns may have been produced in great haste to deal with one or more emergency of the period. Mackay's leather guns were single barreled. Now let's turn specifically to the details of the Battle of Killiecrankie. The government forces at the Battle of Killiecrankie were under the command of General Hugh Mackay. This is General Hugh Mackay who wrote a detailed uh, book about the, all the events leading up to and uh, including the battle itself. A very interesting book which is written in an old English style, some of it which is a little bit difficult to follow but generally speaking it gives a very very accurate account of, what, of the battle from his point of view. In a conventional army like that of Mackay the cavalry are described as the legs and eyes of the army while the infantry and artillery are the body and arms. Three leather guns made up Mackay's artillery which was traditionally port supported by fusiliers, infantry men who were assigned to protect the gunners. In the lead up to the battle the Jacobite forces under the command of John Graham of Claverhouse also known as Bonnie Dundee and the government forces travelling from the south under the command of General Hugh Mackay were in a race to Blair Castle. Strategic importance of, of Blair Castle not only from a north to south route but also from a west route Glencoe to Blair Castle, Braemar to Blair Castle so it was really a centrepiece and in fact the name Blair means a flat piece surrounded by mountains so it provided a passageway through the mountains in all directions. Talking about General Mackay's army his intention 
was to use his lightweight leather guns as a siege weapon had he got to Blair Castle first. He chose the, the lighter guns rather than the conventional cannons which were too cumbersome to drag across uh, uh, high, highland terrain and along narrow tracks. But while his forces struggled to negotiate the narrow steep-sided pass of Killiecrankie, while he was also wary that the enemy might have set an ambush, the Jacobite army was first to arrive at Blair Castle. Not only had Bonnie Dundee won the race to the castle, he went on to secure the higher, superior higher ground over what was to become the battle site. It's not known for sure whether Mackay's leather guns came with him from the Netherlands, where he spent most of his career in the service of William and Orange, later to be William III, or were manufactured locally by James Weems. Mackay's leather guns would have been transported to the battlefield in parts on horseback, then assembled ready for action and positioned close to the centre of the government lines. We are standing about here in the middle of the battlefield. The Redcoat Army battle line is run through here with the three leather guns artillery positioned in the middle of their lines. The Jacobite forces are based on high ground which was uh, um, taken by Bonnie Dundee after he arrived first at Blair Castle. And if we look above us, we can see the high ground behind us, which was obviously strategically a very strong point from which to attack the government forces. As Mackay could not risk starting the battle by advancing up the hill or retreating down the hill to the River Gary, he decided that he would remain in his position to see what the Jacobite forces would decide to do. They might either attack or retire. Finally, to promote the Highlanders and to induce them to engage, he ordered the leather guns to be discharged, but they were of little use. The carriages were much too light and broke after the third firing. Mackay's leather guns did, in, did indeed fail miserably. Only one opposition casualty was reported, a Jacobite named Grant, who was a member of Glengarry's battalion. After being struck by a cannonball, he fell to the ground, but jumped to his feet again without any injury, recording first and possibly the only occasion in military history when a soldier hit by artillery escaped unscathed and lived to tell the tale. So, the Jacobite com commander said, who needs to fear the enemy's artillery when all it could do was knock you over? It's intriguing to think that this cannonball may well have been fired from one of Mackay's leather guns, but we'll never know if it was the one to strike the fortunate grant of Glengarry's uh, battalion. It is among a variety of artefacts recovered from the battle site over many years, reminders of the events of July the 27th, 1689. The failure of Mackay's, Mackay's leather guns might have contributed in a small way to the defeat of the government forces at the Battle of Killiecrankie. After all, under normal circumstances, artillery should be a potent weapon. Both sides suffered considerable losses, including Bonnie Dundee, John Graham of Claverhouse, the inspirational leader of the Jacobites, who fell in the final minutes of what turned out to be a very brief encounter. It has been reliably claimed that the three leather guns displayed in the entrance hall at Blair Castle are Mackay's artillery from the Battle of Killiecrankie. It has also been suggested, however, that they might have come from a Spanish galleon, part of the Spanish Armada, which was sank in Tobermory Bay in October 1588. Without their leather and rope coverings, they have lost their unique appearance. However, their place in history is assured.
Now these are not the guns in Blair Castle but they do show the leather guns without the leather covering and you can see that how they're made up before the leather covering is put on them. Little more was seen of uh, leather guns after the Battle of Killiecrankie, replaced as they were by more reliable cannon with greater firepower and improved manoeuvrability. May I suggest that the next time you go to Blair Castle you make a point of looking, at, looking for the three leather guns uh, which are at the bottom of the staircase in just to the right of the entrance hall and you can recall the history of those artillery pieces uh, when you see them. I've got a couple of footnotes here relating to leather guns. Dear Sandy's Stoops, in 1639 a gun foundry was established in Potterrow, Edinburgh to cast cannon under the eye of Sir Alexander Hamilton known to friends and foes alike as Dear Sandy, a Scot who served in both the Danish and Swedish armies. Hamilton was known for his Dear Sandy Stoops, a frame gun comprising four bronze light cannon mounted possi together, possibly a refinement of the leather cannon invented in Sweden where he served. So there is a direct connection between the two. These cannon were said to be sometimes carried swivel fashion between two horses. They proved very effective in the Battle of Newburn outside Newcastle on the 28th of August 1640. The Scottish Covenanters defeated the English army partly due to the weight of the Scots artillery bombardment. There was no weight of artillery bombardment from the leather guns used by Mackay in the Battle of Killiecrankie. Oh, here we go with another footnote, this one related to wooden guns. In a later development some cannons were manufactured out of wood and used in wars in many countries. The wooden parts were invariably strengthened with metal fittings or even rope as you can see. The use of wood could be dictated either by lack of metal or lack of skill to engineer metallic can uh, cannons. They were notoriously weak and could usually fire only a few shots, sometimes even just one shot, before bursting, much like the leather guns. The balls for wooden barrel cannon were made of various materials such as wood, stone, ceramics or steel. In some wars, fake cannons from a wooden log, sometimes painted black, were used to deceive the enemy, misleading the enemy as to the strength of an emplacement was an effective delaying tactics and both sides in the American Civil War used such fake weapons. This presentation was initiated as a result of my seeing this cannonball many many years ago as a very young boy and I found it a fascinating experience to investigate leather guns and even more details about the Battle of Killiecrankie. Now it may interest you to know that as a result of this other people have come forward with artifacts. One particular person has uh, we visited with what appeared to be a form of ammunition found on the battle site and dug up under a, from under a tree in their garden. This is, this is found on the found on Killiecrankie battlefield this My one. My gosh. Well, I wish I'd found that. <laughs> this this was out there actually, in the, when the, there was a tree came out of the garden and that came up with the roots. It's difficult to know whether that would have been fired by, because the guns are quite big, the the, um, the calibre is quite big. Right. Might, I don't that's, no, it wouldn't be a musket ball, would it? Yeah, it could be. You reckon so? It's certainly heavy enough. Yeah, you've done well. Mm -hmm. oh, that, it's made, this is his first public appearance. Okay. You know what I mean? Can I just take it out of the thing just to. Yeah, yeah, just do, with, do, with it yeah. being dark and. Yeah, no, fine, fine. Yeah. 129 grams. Grams? Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-eight grams. It's it's really interesting to think that the Battle of Killiecrankie only lasted about thirty minutes, 
and yet there's so much more to discover about the battle, how it developed, how it took shape, where the forces were positioned and a great deal of that can be tracked down from the location of artifacts such as musket balls and uh, buttons and uh, various other items, cannonballs and other ammunition. And this means that the story of the Battle of Killiecrankie will continue to be developed over the coming years.